This session we'll be looking at the period from the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West up until the beginnings of the Renaissance. And the names we give to this period tell us a lot about our preconceptions. The Dark Ages. But really, the perceived barbarism of the medieval period was not so very different from that of any of the ages that preceded it. Most notably the Roman Empire with its military expansionism, its penchant for bloody spectacle. Medieval, the Middle Ages, between two significant ages. But that's falling into a trap, as Gombrich puts it in the story of art, of the naive misinterpretation of the constant change in art as a continuous process. In other words, we criticise medieval art for not representing a straight line between the Roman Empire and the Renaissance. Gombrich continued, No doubt we expect such progress in the past because we are in a hurry to get to ourselves. Worse then, we expect straight lines leading up to the present. But history is not a straight line. History is complex and problematic. And each phenomenon in history deserves close inspection on its own terms. That said, there is a connection, perhaps a broken line, between the Byzantine East and the Western Renaissance in the periodical revival of classicism. The first of these proto-Renaissances was the Carolingian Renaissance at the end of the 8th century in the court of the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne, or Charles the Great. In Aix-en-Chapelle, or Aachen, on the present-day border between Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands, Charlemagne gathered together scholars, including Alcuin of York, and developed an architectural precursor of the Romanesque in the chapel itself, and it uses classical Corinthian capitals. The scholarly court was renowned for its classical learning, its translations and illuminations, as in, for example, this illustrated Gospel of Aachen, here with the four evangelists. Anticlockwise from top left, Matthew, John, Luke and Mark, with their respective attributes, the angel, the eagle, the ox and the lion. Although the landscape has very little recession in terms of space, it is naturalistically represented and there is foreshortening of the writing desks and stalls. And the drapery of the cloaks of the evangelists derives purely from Roman models. The second of the three proto-Renaissances was in the 10th century, under Otto I or Otto the Great, in Saxony, uh, or present-day northwestern Germany. It was an important precursor of the Romanesque style which would develop in the new millennium. Its style, though, was arguably closer to the Carolingian models than the original classical ones. The Romanesque, while named for modelling itself on classical forms, is characterised by its idiosyncratic thick columns and heavy arches. The use of the groin vault, whereby two barrel vaults intersect with two crossing ribs, was an important revival, and the construction te techniques used in these ribs would later be exploited to create the Gothic style in the Ile de France. The Roman 2nd century AD Porta Negra, the gateway to the town uh, of Trier, provided an easily available model for Trier's cathedral, both employing hierarchies of arches and rounded towers. The Romanesque developed in northern Italy into the Tuscan Renaissance, the most notable examples being the Duomo and Baptistery in Pisa, and several early churches that we can see in Florence. The building campaign of the Capetian kings in France allowed a new style to flourish. As noted earlier, the extensive use of rib supports in the Gothic allowed wider, lighter ceilings and thinner columns, allowing more light in and more stained glass to be used. The prototype of the Gothic was designed by Abbot Suger for the Basilica of Saint-Denis, now a northern suburb of Paris. The rose window became a standard in the Gothic and provided the unlettered with a religious imagery in transcendental colours with an otherworldly intensity which would have been rare 
in medieval towns. By the 13th and 14th centuries, the classical style had begun to influence practitioners such as the painters Cimabue, Duccio, Giotto. The sculptors Nicola Pisano and his son Giovanni, between them, executed a number of pulpits and shrines with high relief panel sculpture and architectural sculptures in the round on church buildings in Tuscany, Umbria and Emilia Romana. Their sculpted high relief panels show the influence of classical models such as carved sarcophagi as well as Byzantine ivories. The Pisani are mentioned in Giorgio Vasari's Lives of the Most Excellent Painters, Sculptors and Architects, as are uh, Giotto Bondoni and Cimabue Duccio, as I've mentioned. And Giotto de Bondoni, Giotto, whose masterwork was the Scroveni Chapel in Padua, we'll now look at. The chapel is named after the donor of the land on which it was built, Enrico Scrovegni, a moneylender. And it was common for people in this profession at this time to donate to the church because usury or lending money for interest that was deemed excessive was considered a sin. The chapel features a last judgment on the counter facade, along with scenes from the life of Christ and allegorical figures on the walls and a vault featuring the Mother of God and the Christ as sons in a star-studded heaven. <laughs>